our presenter tonight is Jane O'Neill, who's an independent historian, or I'm sorry, an independent scholar, an art historian, <laughs> who holds a master's in art history from Boston University, as well as a master's in art education from Harvard. Jane is from New Hampshire, and she's worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, including most recently at SNHU. And Jane delivers a variety of humanities and art appreciation programs through her company, Culturally Curious. And you can find more about her work and those programs on her website, which is IamCulturallyCurious.com. And I'll put that link in the chat window in just a second. So join me in welcoming tonight's presenter, Jane O'Neill. Thank you so much, Tricia. I'm very happy to be with everybody tonight. Let me just bring up that slideshow. Here we go. All right. So thank you everybody for um, starting off your holiday weekend with us here tonight. We're going to have um, a number of really fun and fascinating images to look at together. And um, it's really an honor and a privilege for me to be able to lead this program. So thank you to New Hampshire Humanities and to Tricia for um, inviting me to do this. So I wanted to get started talking about women in art with this title screen right here, this, this image that's probably pretty familiar to most of us right off the bat, and that is Rosie the Riveter, right? Flexing her bicep, looking right out at us. And I think a lot of people think of this image as sort of a feminist icon. And I wanted to start with it because it's actually an image that's uh, a little bit more complicated. It was made by a man in 1943. The artist's name is J. Howard Milner. And this is seen by art historians as being sort of a complicated image because this is an image that is um, supposed to sort of entice women uh, away from being homemakers to uh, helping with the war effort. And actually it, it meant that they were sort of balancing both. And as they were helping with the war effort, they were getting paid less than men. So even though we see this strong, tough, beautiful woman, uh, she's unfortunately sort of being maxed out in every capacity um, by being asked to do so much during the war. But I think the image still resonates today because she is so strong and so beautiful. So um, we'll get back to her. We'll, we'll be looking at her again in this presentation, but I think that she's a great image to start off with, thinking about being strong. So fierce women and women in art, let's get going. Um, in the history of art, and we're going to be doing a couple of sort of sweeping looks at the history of art throughout this, uh, this program, but generally speaking, men have been depicted as triumphant, as heroes, as um, men of action, and women, generally speaking, have been, are more likely to be depicted as um, idle, <laughs> as um, at rest, at reading. Um, and I think uh, this comparison here is, is a great comparison to sort of show this disparity in the way that men and women have traditionally been presented in art. So on the left, we have uh, Jacques-Louis David's de um, Napoleon crossing the Alps. Napoleon is up on a horse. He's triumphant. The wind is blowing. His cape is in the air. His hand is raised. And, and I mean, it's, it's all about confidence an action here. And then we compare that with the image on the right, which is Edmund Tarbell's Reverie from 1913. This one's at the MFA. You might have seen it in person. And, um, and the woman is, is literally lost in thought and, um, and, and inactive and, and, and totally idle here. So in the art world, you sort of see the same thing taking place. Oftentimes it's men who are the creators and women are, um, are treated as passive objects. And I think that this is such a great image to underscore that idea because the artist here, who's the French artist Jérôme, he shows the artist actively working and uh, a woman who's modeling for him who may as well uh, be the very sculpture that she is modeling for, uh, again, idle and inactive and just a source of inspiration as opposed to um, cre creating something herself. So let's think about that, that idea within the, the within 
the framework of, of fierce females and what does it mean to be fierce? So I've sort of created a definition for us tonight. And, um, and our working definition is fierce females, women who created art that defied, I would say, gender expectations and pushed beyond the boundaries of what was considered appropriate, acceptable, or desirable for their time. And I have this uh, stunning image up here on the screen. This is uh, a work by a lesser known uh, Baroque artist named um, Elisabetta Serrani. And the image here is Timoclea. Uh, it's an image from uh, a story from classical um, antiquity. And it's uh, uh, Timoclea killing her rapist from 1659. And so we don't have the context of, of sort of what transpired between these two individuals in the, in, the, in the image. All we see is a woman throwing a man into a well. So it's this dramatic sort of violent image that immediately captures your attention. You dive right into it. But um, interestingly enough, the artist here, um, Sirani, was um, was sort of an advocate for other female artists, even back in the 1600s. So she was championing um, and, and instructing other women. She had a very brief career because she died mysteriously at the age of 27. But I would say somebody like, like Sirani falls right within this definition of fierce. Another artist that I would put into this category is the artist, the Swiss artist, um, whose name I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, um, Pipolotti Riest. Uh, and what we're looking at here is a film still from a video that she did that is called Ever Is Over All. And this is in the collection of a number of museums, but in particular, um, this one I pulled from the New Museum in New York City. And what we see in this still it's very important here. I love this sort of diaphanous blue dress that she has on and the red heels. Um, she looks, you know, incredibly feminine in what she's wearing. But of course, she's caught in the act here of breaking a, 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 a car window with a baseball bat. So she is definitely defying gender expectations here. She's literally smashing expectations. She's anti-authoritarian. Um, it's this expression of freedom. And we see even our artists today quoting um, a uh, video here. So uh, I have as a comparison, a film still <laughs> from a pop video of the uh, international pop sensation Beyonce, uh, who was very purposely quoting what Rist was doing um, just a few decades earlier. And Beyonce is somebody who never shied away from this um, this, this idea of being fierce. In fact, that's a word that she sort of attached herself to in many ways. Um, it, honestly, if you look up Beyonce, you'll find this word fierce attached to her. <laughs> and she's also not afraid of the other F word, which is feminist. <laughs> and before I make this all about Beyonce, one last connection here is that she um, is very clearly sort of quoting an art historical past and, and looking for sources of feminine strength in our sort of visual literacy. And, and so here she is, of course, quoting Rosie the Riveter here. So this is all just a preamble to get us thinking about women in art and fierce women in art. So let me give you the lay of the land and how we'll be spending the next hour together. Um, I have a lot of material for you. So I'm going to be going through this pretty quickly. So we're going to start off with a very brief overview of women in art. And, um, and, cons and consider some of the barriers for women participating in the arts. And then I have all of these great female artists that we'll be touching on. And of course, we can't get, um, we can't get deep into their biographies or into you know, their entire bodies of work, but we'll be touching on what I think makes them pretty fierce. And then we'll finish off by sort of looking ahead or looking at the landscape today and thinking about what is the art world like for women. So, and um, before we move on, I just have to mention this gorgeous picture that I have up on the screen. It's just one of my all time favorite at the Met. The, um, the artist here is La Ville Guillard, a French artist. This is her self portrait with her two pupils from 1785. It's a really large painting. It's about seven feet tall. And um, interestingly enough, the artist that we see here at work was a French miniaturist. So here she's creating this huge painting, even though she sort of specialized in miniatures. 
And she was somebody who was always advocating for opportunities for other female artists and was actually the first female artist to get permission to bring her students into the Louvre to study the work there. So she was a pioneer in her own right. So let's get started with this brief overview of the history of women in art. And we're going to start from the very beginning, <laughs> but it will be brief. Uh, what we're looking at here is a prehistoric cave painting from um, Chauvy Cave in France. And I just love this image. I think this is my favorite uh, prehistoric cave painting of all time uh, because we have this, this sort of layer of layer upon layer of these elegant, I think they're horse heads um, lined up together. And they're just beautifully drawn. I mean, they're gorgeous contour drawings. If I could draw like that today, I'd be proud of it. And, and so um, uh, this cave in particular, you might be familiar with if you've ever seen the Werner Herzog movie, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, the great movie. So there's all of these prehistoric cave paintings, many of them in Spain and France, and, um, and, they, and they tend to feature animals like the ones that you see here. You probably see these big animal bodies here with these tiny little legs. And for years, art historians have talked about um, prehistoric man going into these caves and creating these paintings possibly as like a ceremony for inducting like new hunters into their tribes. And I even remember with my, um, with my textbook in college, there was even this image, I love this image, I think it's hysterical, of a modern day artist complete with his beret showing us how a, a prehistoric man might have made these marks on the wall of their handprint. Um, so all of these, many of these prehistoric caves do have these handprints throughout them. This is a cave in Argentina that's known as the Cave of Hands. And it was just within the past decade that National Geographic published a story um, wherein archaeologists have gone back and looked more carefully at these handprints and determined that three quarters of all handprints in all prehistoric caves um, are women's hands. So we've always thought of these hands as being um, like signatures on these paintings and having this important role in these paintings. And only now are we sort of realizing and, and coming to terms with the fact that the stories that we've created around these handprints and, and these cave paintings is totally different than what we had previously imagined because they were made by women. So moving forward up to classical antiquity, I have two uh, Greek vase paintings on the screen here. Um, the one on the left is um, a 5th century BC painting by the Berlin painter and on the right we have the carpenter painting painter which is also from the 5th century. And I bring in these two images because when we think about painting in, in, um, in the ancient world, Greek vase painting is um, is probably some of our best source for material. And generally speaking, art historians think of Greek vase painters as being male. And that is I, no doubt in part because of the subject matter here. On the left, if you look carefully, you can see this is a battle scene um, with the Amazons taking place. And then on the right, we've actually got a homoerotic scene of a teacher and his pupil down at the center of this vase looking into it. So subject matter like this led art historians to believe that almost all vase painters would have been um, would have been male. But we do know that this incredible mosaic that was found in Pompeii, excavated in Pompeii, was based off of a famous Greek uh, vase painting from a couple of centuries earlier. And we know from records that existed back then that that Greek vase painter was a woman named Helen of, Helen of Egypt. So this incredible mosaic that we're looking at, which is um, one of the masterworks of the ancient world, this is a 17 foot long mosaic. And here's just a detail here. This is Alexander um, staring down Darius in, um, in this great battle scene. And so we have all of this incredible light and shadow, um, this tension in terms of the storytelling, the, a lot of drama and chaos. And it was all originally sourced from a woman, which is wonderful. So we're going to zoom forward from classical antiquity into the Middle Ages. And what we're looking at here are two pages from uh, illuminated manuscripts, illustrated manuscripts. And, um, and it wasn't uncommon for the scribes or the monks who, um, 
who actually uh, uh, did, uh, wrote out these manuscripts to include images of themselves in the illustrations of these manuscripts. So in particular, the image on the left is known as the Edwin Psalter because of this figure that we see here who shows himself sort of hard at work. And the inscription in, in the text actually describes him as being like the prince of scribes. <laughs> and then we have another image over here on the right of St. Mark, who's also sort of in the process of creating one of these books. So it wasn't unusual to show men as creators in, in texts that were written around 1100, 1200. And the image that I have here for you <clears throat> is a rare image of a woman who has, um, signed her own work in this manuscript. And the text here that sort of circles around her says Gouda, a sinner, wrote and painted this book. So we do know that, uh, that women, and pr pr probably primarily nuns, were also illustrating these texts. And this image that we're looking at here is one of the first women in Western civilization to create a signed self-portrait. That's kind of mind boggling. So this dates to about 1290. We know that other nuns were involved in this sort of work too. Just last year, this um, jaw <laughs> was discovered. It's about 900 years old. I believe it was found in Germany. And what we're looking at here, you can probably see that there's like this blue pebble that looks like it's sort of lodged in the bone here. And that is a piece of ultramarine, which would have been a pigment made from lapis lazuli, which was, um, a blue stone that was imported all the way from Afghanistan. So about 4,000 miles away, it was as valuable as gold. And the reason it's in this, this bone here is because the woman who, who, who this jaw belonged to was no doubt a painter and was probably licking her brush or inserting her brush into her mouth to wet her brush at certain points. So this very valuable stone gets lodged into her jaw, which is amazing. So again, archeology span sort of supporting um, new information <laughs> that tells us about women in the arts. And as we move closer to the modern era, we know more about these women um, with, with just sort of art historical and, and historical resources. So the woman that I have here on the left is um, Edmonia Lewis, this incredible sort of groundbreaking American sculptor from the 19th century. She was born in 1840, if I remember correctly. And the image that we have on the right is an example of the kind of sculpture bust that she was creating with um, sort of minimal training. This is actually a sculpture of the abolitionist John Brown. And and Edmonia Lewis was um, uh, African American and Native American, and so she didn't really. She was she was born free, but she didn't really have um, access to the kind of training that she would have liked to have had here in America. But uh, obviously, she was um, producing great work, and she would produce sculptural busts like this um, in and around Boston. And eventually, she saved up enough money to go to Rome and receive really formal. Um, training as a sculptor. So in, when she was about 32 years old, she created this monumental 3,000 pound marble sculpture that you see here. <laughs> and this is the death of Cleopatra. And it was entered into the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876. And at the time, Cleopatra was a really popular subject matter. She was historical um, and she was beautiful. It was, it was um, a way for a lot of artists to kind of tap in to, um, to, to themes that were popular. And, um, and for Edmonia Lewis, she decided to sort of approach the subject in a different way. Instead of um, showing Cleopatra uh, sort of before her death or kind of contemplating suicide, she shows us sort of in the throes of death or right after she's died. And so um, her breast is bare, she's sort of fallen backwards. And, um, and people at the time, I, I mean, some critics sort of referred to this as being repellent or being ghastly, but it became the most popular work in the show. People were really taken with it, I think because um, it, it had this, this kind of informal and immediate quality to it. Uh, amazingly, because uh, I, I, mean, I think today, Edmonia Lewis's uh, biography would have sort of kept her in the spotlight, but amazingly, 
uh, shortly after after this work was exhibited, it, it sort of um, it, it, it was all but forgotten. And they they um, they found it in, in various places. It, it ended up in a, a Chicago saloon, and then it marked a horse's grave for many years at a suburban racetrack, and then it eventually appeared in the salvage yard in the 1980s, and now I believe it's in the collection of the Smithsonian. So that's why it looks probably a little bit rough around the edges here. So, um, so this next image that I wanted to show you as we're finishing up this very brief history of women in art is an image by the uh, female painter, Alice Neal. And this is such an important painting here because the subject matter here, uh, the woman is named Linda Nochlin and she's a very important art historian who, um, who wrote a groundbreaking text in the 1970s, the early 1970s. She wrote, why have there been no great women artists? Which is a really interesting question to ask. And, um, and there were a couple of reasons that came out in her text. And the first of them was probably, uh, is, is this idea of lack of training and lack of opportunity. So when you look at something like this, um, which, was, which is an image of, um, uh, by, by an artist named Matthew Pratt. It's called The American School from 1765. Uh, so this was, uh, you know, what artists training looked like, and it certainly didn't include women. So a lot of times when you see successful uh, female artists, it's because they were um, either married to an artist or the daughter of an artist. The other thing that Linda Nochlin pointed out in her groundbreaking article was this idea that, um, that we have this idea of, of the male uh, genius, the myth of the male genius in art. We often talk about Michelangelo or Picasso as being a genius, but when's the last time you heard someone refer to like George O'Keefe as being a genius? It's much easier for us somehow to sort of uh, place this idea of genius on, on men than it is on women. And then, um, so that's sort of working against a lot of women in the art world. Just very quickly, I've just got a few more slides here that show, um, this is from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, the, the premier um, art education institution in France in the 19th century. And again, we don't see any female students here because they're using male models and, um, and that would have been considered indecent for, for most women at the time to participate in something like that. So, so to finish up our history, our very brief history, what we have here is a Guerrilla Girls poster from 1985, and I just love it. It says, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Less than 5% of the artists in the modern art section are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. So the Guerrilla Girls are like this sort of activist group that they've, they've been around for a long time and they're kind of an anonymous collective that wear these gorilla masks and they kind of, they, they consider themselves sort of the conscience of the art world. So this is a, such an important question that they raised uh, decades ago and it's still very much relevant today. So we're going to switch gears and start looking at some of these artists, some of these fierce female artists and consider what exactly makes them fierce. So uh, I'm just looking at time and I'm thinking, I'm strategizing here. So we're just going to be spending a few moments really on most of these artists and we're going to be moving through them chronologically. So our first artist here is Artemisia Gentileschi. She was a, an Italian Baroque artist and this is her famous self-portrait as the allegory of painting. And this is just, this is a fierce painting to begin with, just because she's doing something that no male artist could do. This is 1638 that she painted this. And just by showing herself as an allegory, an allegory was typically a, um, a female symbol of something like literature or war or something like that, but only a female could, could represent painting. So she is showing herself as the very idea of painting, which again, no male artist could do. She's using the edge of the, of the painted canvas here to sort of simulate her, the, 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 um, the, the surface of the, the canvas that she's painting. Uh, she has this sort of uh, tousled black hair, which is um, sort of standard for the way that, that the allegory was typically represented. And even this face, this mask down here on the chain would have indicated to contemporary viewers that that was what she was trying to do. She was trying to indicate that she was this allegory. So it's a, it's a very cool idea right off the bat. 
And Artemisia Gentileschi is very well known for this kind of um, sort of tragic and scandal, uh, uh, that tra this tragic scandal that occurred in her life at a young age, which is oftentimes really closely associated with her work. And that is the fact that she herself was uh, the victim of rape. And, um, and so it's, it's hard not to talk about that when you're looking at these images in particular. But I wanted to show you her representation of Susanna and the Elders. This is her first known work from 1610. And I think that this is such an interesting work outside of her biography here because um, Artemisia Gentileschi learned to paint from her father and her, and her father's studio. That was how she got access to training. And her father's uh, representation of the same subject matter is here on the left. And so when you look at them, when you compare them and you think about a woman's lived experience and what it's like for a young woman to sort of be accosted by two older men, her father represents that as you know, sort of a, a pinch of the flesh, but Susanna herself, she's just rolling her eyes in annoyance. Um, and then when Artemisia Gentileschi approaches the subject matter, we have this young woman whose body, I, I, I feel like looks so much more real, um, the, uh, or maybe more like a, <laughs> maybe more like a marble statue, but, but in many ways, very real, um, but, but it's twisting and it's, 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 um, it's almost like pinwheeling away from these older men. And, and her, her facial expression really indicates the, the stress that she's under um, with this encounter. And I, I feel like it's a much more realistic representation of what it's like for a woman to be in, in an unfortunate situation like that. So after this, this, uh, this rape that takes place in Artemisia Gentileschi's life, uh, we begin to see these very dark, violent paintings. And this is something that Artemisia Gentileschi becomes very well known for. And here we have the biblical subject matter of Judith slaying Holofernes. So it's a, a young woman who has um, gone into the tent of, of this army commander and this oppressor. She seduces him. And then when he falls asleep, she and her maidservant um, behead him. So this is this very violent interaction and and it's a master composition because we see this kind of push and pull, um, the arms coming in this way, his legs expanding out this way, the push of, of, the, of the sword going down, his arm going back up. So even though there's blood squirting and there's this darkness and this, this chaos, she's really created this incredibly beautiful balanced composition here and i'd love to just show you how this is so different from what uh male artists were were creating in terms of the same subject at the same time so on the left is caravaggio's depiction of the same subject judith beheading colifernes and his is from just a few years before hers and you don't get that, that same dynamism that that she that she produced in her painting and of course in her career she goes on and on to create more and more of these images of, of these kind of uh, victorious and very violent women, um, oftentimes from, from, from the Bible. Uh, so she's, she's kind of a fascinating character and certainly qualifies as fierce by our definition, uh, to our working definition tonight, because she was really showing women that were defying gender expectation. I should mention that this, this work is called um, Jail and Sisera, this is from 1620. So this is another biblical woman that um, kills a man to save the Israelites. And in this case, I think she's using a tent post. It's pretty awful to think about. <laughs> so moving ahead in time, up through history, our next artist here is a French artist named Rosa Bonheur. And, um, and we have her dates up on the screen. I love this portrait of her with this giant, I, I think this is a bull, right? <laughs> this was painted by a male artist named um, Edouard uh, Louis Dubuffet. And this is from 1857. So um, what he is showing us here is, is who Rosa Bonheur was. She was uh, what, uh, what was known as an animaleur. <laughs> That's what the French would call it, because she was an artist who specialized in the depiction of animals. She and several of her family members um, specialized in animals, and they were trained by her father. And Rosa Bonheur uh, was one of, if not 
the most famous and successful female artists of the 19th century. So let's sort of dig in and see, see a little bit more about um, what kind of work she was producing. For the most part, <laughs> she was um, creating sort of sentimental um, but incredibly skilled depictions of horses, sometimes cattle, sometimes um, goats and dogs like you see here. Um, I love these two works, they're beautiful. The, the white horse is from 1866 and the um, briquet hound is from 1856, uh, 1856 and this is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So, um, so Rosa Bonheur really made a name for herself with this incredible painting that we see here. This is a huge painting that's at the Metropolitan Museum. It's roughly eight feet by 16 feet long. We can think of it as almost like a, a giant um, frieze, like the Parthenon. If you're familiar with those sculptures along the top of the Parthenon, um, it's this parade of horses. And that's essentially what we're seeing here. This is the horse fair from 1855. And this is a, 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 essentially a common occurrence. It would have been a common occurrence in Paris. And uh, Rosa Bonheur would go to this horse fair on a weekly basis and sketch there. And, um, and she actually decided to dress like a man to discourage any sort of unwanted attention. So when she, when she ultimately kind of unveiled this work, it was just considered incredible. It helped to uh, uh, really establish her career. She, it was um, widely acclaimed. And, um, and then Rosa Bonheur goes on to lead this very sort of successful but very unconventional life uh, for a female artist. So here are two photographs of the artist. And, um, and as, she, as she continued her career, she regularly visited abattoirs and veterinary schools. She um, participated in the dissection of animals. And she actually received permission from the French government to wear pants <laughs> so that she could move about these spaces and, um, and draw less attention to herself. You can see she smoked, she hunted, and she was openly gay. She once told a male friend of hers, um, if you only knew how little I cared for your sex, you wouldn't get such queer ideas in your head. The fact is, in the way of males, I only like the bulls I paint. <laughs> so she was um, a really sort of outstanding, fierce female for her time. And she was actually the first woman to ever receive the Grand Cross by the French Legion of Honor, which you can see she's wearing in the photograph on the right. So um, an exceptional and fierce woman, no doubt. Our next artist is one that's probably very familiar to most of you, and that is Mary Cassatt. Um, and I had a lot of conversations with friends and, um, and, and, and with colleagues over the years and who, who really questioned my uh, inclusion of Mary Cassatt in this program because most people think of Mary Cassatt as the painter of mothers and babies. Uh, what we see here, uh, but I, 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 do have, I do have a little thesis here. I do think that there's a part of her career that makes her particularly fierce. This is her self-portrait from 1878. And I think she is looking a little fierce here too. Um, she is one of uh, three really prominent um, impressionist painters working in France in the later part of the 19th century. We have Marie Brachmond in the middle and then um, Berth Morisot on the right. And um, three images by those same artists give us a sense in terms of what female impressionist painters were painting. And like I said, we see a lot of mothers with their babies, beautiful pictures. We see a lot of, um, you know, women, almost like that, that first image we started with reverie, you know, lost in thought, reading, or again, sort of engaged in any sort of domestic um, activity, like looking over an infant. So we have this idea of Mary Cassatt being a French Impressionist artist and then being friends with someone like Edgar Degas, who we see in his self-portrait on the, on the right. This is from 1863. And Edgar Degas, as a male artist, could go out to the cafe concerts in Paris and 
rub elbows with um, with people of all different classes. He could enjoy sort of raunchy shows. I love this image of, of the woman performing on the left here. It's called The Song of the Dog. She looks like she's quite the performer. <laughs> but Mary Cassatt, as an upper class woman, really couldn't do anything like that. And that's why you see so many of her paintings uh, sort of reserved for this domestic sphere. And oftentimes, I, I mean, my heart goes out to these women because they really look bored to me in a lot of these pictures, or they look restrained by the rules that they, that the social rules that they sort of have to abide by. So these are two pictures of, you know, women having tea from um, the early to mid 1880s. But where Mary Cassatt breaks these rules and where she has a lot of fun and she gets a little fierce is at the Paris Opera. And so the image that we see on the left is actually a painting of her sister. It's called Woman in a Pearl Necklace. It's from 1879. And, um, and I have uh, on the right a photograph of the inside of the Paris Opera. If you've never been there, put it on your bucket list. It's someplace that everybody should see at some point in their lives. But essentially, it's the view of the theater from the stage. So you get the sense that it's this big horseshoe and there's multiple tiers of balconies that, that encircle that horseshoe. And so we get the sense that her sister is sitting in one of these balconies and that there's a mirror behind her. And so she's looking out at these crowds here. And, and so you get sort of this, this wonderful sense of freedom with this, with this picture. I mean, she looks way more sort of alive and engaged than, than one of these other mothers that we've seen so far. But what Mary Cassatt gives us in um, this short series that she does of, of women at the opera is women engaging in the act of looking. And it sounds very simple, but, uh, um, but the act of looking is an act of power. And my, my sort of simple analogy here is imagine you're in a cafeteria and you've dropped your tray of food and it's just smashed to the ground and all eyes are on you all of a sudden. And just the act of looking, it makes you an object, it makes you powerless, <laughs> and it gives power to everybody else who's doing the looking. And that is exactly what Mary Cassatt is doing with these women here. She's giving them the binoculars, she's giving them the opportunity to check out every other person who's there at the opera. And so we're going to zoom in on this incredible image that's over here on the right. And this is in the collection of the MFA down in Boston. So it's just called In the Box from um, 1879, or sorry, it's, it's called um, At the Opera. And so we have this woman who in, in every way that she's presented looks, um, she, doesn't, she doesn't look frivolous. She looks like a serious person that, she, that we should respect. And here she is engaged in the act of looking. And if we follow this, this railing that her elbow is on, it takes us back to this man back here who I've blown up over here on the left, and he's engaged in the act of looking at her. So this is really all about um, that, that power that, that, that one gets when one takes on the gaze. And just, this is the classic art, his, art history comparison. Uh, the other French Impressionist painter, Renoir, gives us this wonderful comparison here uh, with the painting in the, uh, called La Loge and it's uh, from 1874. And so here he's presenting us a woman who is merely an object. She's just decorative. She's, you know, she's got flowers and pearls and gold, and she's just sitting there for us to, to gaze upon. And he's given her a date here who's very clearly not watching the show. He is using his opera glasses to check out other people. So he gets to engage in that act of looking and she is sort of sitting there powerless. Uh, but Mary Cassatt, as a female artist, gives her subject on the right that, that power. Um, and I think that she sort of revels in it too. It's pretty wonderful. So switching gears, um, moving into the 20th century, we're getting exciting now. <laughs> so now we're going to be looking at Georgia O'Keeffe. 
and everybody's heard of her. Um, she's a superstar of American modernism, and she has this incredible legacy of the flower paintings. So of course, flower paintings are a traditional subject for women artists going back centuries, but we're going to see how Georgia O'Keeffe appro approaches the subject matter differently. Even from early on, her works in the 19 teens show this early interest in not just florals, but also modernism, modern forms. These are the kinds of works that she sort of sent ahead when she was um, first corresponding with her husband, uh, her, well, her soon to be husband, Alfred Stieglitz. And, and he saw in her this, um, this kind of innate ability and, and this kind of, um, striking modernism. So, um, so after they get together and, um, and uh, become a couple, by the 1920s, she's creating these kind of monumental flower paintings, like the image that you see here called Red Kana from 1924. And so, of course, what we're looking at here is a really sort of radical way of depicting a flower. She is putting us inside the flower. You almost feel like you're inside the flower with a giant light bulb. It's, it's like lit up from within. Uh, she details, you know, every petal, every fold, and, um, and it is sensual. It's beautiful. And just to underscore how different this is from the history of flower painting, I have in comparison here uh, a painting from the early 1700s by Rachel Roish. And here it's about the bouquet, it's about the variety, it's about some flowers in bloom and some in decay and all of this incredible detail. And of course, Georgia O'Keeffe has turned that on its head. We've just, we've zoomed in on just this one flower and we're understanding it in an entirely different way. And um, even though this is just a portion of, of the work that she produced over her very long career, I think these are the works that she's best known for. This is gray line with black, blue, and yellow from 1923. And so of course, we all know the, the theory about these pictures that make most grown-ups blush is that, um, that these are paintings of female genitalia. And it was actually her husband who was, um, this great advocate of, 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 of American modernism. It was her husband, Alfred Stieglitz, that was really kind of promoting that idea about her work. And it really helped to make her work famous. It helped to make her work very well known. And, um, and she never really said that that was what they were about, but it certainly helped to really launch her, her career. Here's another example. This, oh, it's lovely. I love this sort of like inky, um, black and blue in this picture. This is Jack in the Pulpit 4 from 1930. And so by the 1970s, you have um, this wave of feminist art historians who look back at Georgia O'Keeffe's work and at paintings like this, and they do see them as examples of, of female empowerment. Whether or not Georgia O'Keeffe was trying to draw associations to female anatomy, they do see them as, as, um, as, as statements to that effect. And, and they certainly do have their staying power and you know, this incredible ability to make us blush <laughs> and to make us really try to consider um, what she was aiming for when she did create these images. So our next artist here is a photographer. And so I've tried to include as many different uh, media as possible at this presentation. And I loved learning about Lee Miller as I was putting this program together. So Lee Miller was a, a female war correspondent who covered the US Army in the European theater during World War II. And here's a photograph of her. Here's some earlier photographs of her. She was actually, she started off her career as a model. She grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York. She eventually moves to New York City and she has one of these classic New York City um, success stories where she was about to step out into the street and somebody stopped her from getting hit by a cab. Who was it? It was Condé Nast and like, you know, a month later she's modeling for Vogue. So she was this uh, gorgeous woman, really striking woman. And, um, and she had this ability to surround herself with fascinating and, um, and successful artists. <laughs> so she worked with um, photographers like Ed Edward Steichen and um, 
and uh, and eventually even Man Ray. She ends up moving to uh, Paris, to France, to work specifically with uh, the artist Man Ray. She was really interested in in uh, his sort of surrealist work. So the image that I have here on the on the left is a photograph by Miller called Nude Bent Forward from 1930. And there were a lot of surrealist artists who were creating works that looked like this. What makes Miller's photograph really different is that it's not, um, it's, it's like a disorienting look at the female body, but it's not overtly sexual. It's sort of an interesting take on it. Um, <clears throat> Many male artists were looking at the female body in a different way. And then on the right is an example of one of Man Ray's uh, uh, works. It's a metronome, and he has taken a photograph of Lee Miller's eye, and it's, it's sort of the, the TikTok part of that metronome. So they were collaborating. She's, um, again, sort of rubbing elbows with all these important figures in the art world. And then World War II breaks out. And she's just in, um, in really interesting places and has the ability to capture these incredible images. So what we're looking at on the left is, the title is An Exhausted Nurse at the 44th Evacuation Hospital, Normandy, France from 1944. This image with its caption always just like takes my breath away. It's a photograph taken a month after um, D-Day in Normandy. There were 40 nurses attached to this mobile hospital eight miles south of Omaha Beach. Between the 5th of July and August 4th, they treated 4,500 patients and they only lost 50 of them. So you can imagine how hard this woman was working and, um, and the sense of fatigue there, <laughs> but also the sense of, of, of success too, hopefully. Uh, and then uh, this incredible image of the, the children celebrating on the right. This is uh, uh, at the liberation of France, 1944. So joy and, uh, and a, a little bit of exhaustion. Uh, Lee Miller sort of captures so many different facets of World War II. We have a, a dead SS guard in a canal from 1945 and a bombed out chapel from 1940. So she's not afraid to, um, to tackle a really sort of dark and uh, troubling subject matter. And she actually even gained access to two concentration camps while she was um, in Europe. And she doc documented some of the conditions there. This is um, Buchenwald a con concentration camp. And this is just such a striking image. It's, I mean, it's heartbreaking to look at because we, we see so many just uh, starving, emaciated men here um, on, on these bunk beds. And, and I can only imagine what they were thinking as someone like Lee Miller was walking through this space. Um, so, so we see kind of all these different expressions. Um, there's, a, there's interest, there's trepidation, there's worry, there's concern, and maybe even a little hope on some of these, these faces, but it's, it's such a striking photo. Um, but the image that she's probably best known for is this one here. Uh, and this is not a photograph that she took. This is, she's the subject matter here. She oftentimes teamed up with an American photographer named David Sherman from Life Magazine. And, um, and what they've done here, David Sherman has taken this photograph. They're actually in Hitler's apartment. They went there shortly after visiting the concentration camps and they staged this photograph. It's very clearly staged. <laughs> There's actually a photograph of Hitler in the bathtub here. Um, and they've you know, put some art objects around the tub. She's got you know, the muddy boots here, um, you know, straight from the concentration camp. And she's sitting, taking a bath in Hitler's tub. But, um, but what art historians always point to is the fact that that hose in the tub almost sort of functions like a noose behind her. So it's a really striking image and she certainly qualifies as a fierce fem female um, for her bravery in terms of being in Europe and documenting so much of what was happening um, during World War II. So 
We've only got a few more to go. <laughs> Hope you're staying with me. Our next artist is one that is probably very familiar to many people too. Uh, Frida Kahlo, the, the Mexican painter um, who is um, the subject of, you know, Frida mania today. Everybody um, loves to talk about Frida Kahlo. She's in, you know, uh, Disney movies. Um, but I love this picture of her because it's so instructive in terms of of her life and her artwork. Because if you know anything about Frida Kahlo, you know that at a very young age, I think about 18 years old, she was involved in a horrible trolley accident. And it caused physical and emotional pain really uh, for the rest of her life. She had, I think, 30 surgeries uh, during the course of her life. Uh, she, you know, she broke her, her leg in multiple places, um, her back, her collarbone. And, um, and she was um, literally pierced by um, one of those brass bars from one of the, the trolleys, which uh, made it um, virtually impossible for her to have children. And then in addition to that, she was um, involved, well, she was married to a man that, that, um, that she once described as being as, as kind of the other big accident in her life. <laughs> she, they, had, um, they had a great and intense love affair, but it caused a, a great deal of, of, of heartache for her throughout the marriage. So we have Frida here, um, bedridden, lying on her back, creating this sort of intimate portrait because this is what she was really capable of doing um, because uh, her physical pain was so limiting. So here is a painting, a self-portrait that's called Broken Column from 1946. Um, her paintings are oftentimes compared to those of um, Vincent Van Gogh because Van Gogh, we could oftentimes see that emotional pain in his artwork and Frida spells out her physical pain in her artwork. So we see the nails and the skin, we see her spine represented as this broken column, we see tears pouring down her face. And of course, even the landscape here is fractured and broken, just like her body. So her physical pain was the subject of many works of art. This one is called the, the Tree of Hope Remains Strong. And, um, and so she oftentimes represents uh, herself in, in, um, in two, two different bodies, two different forms, two different identities. And so here she's, you know, sort of the, the victim of a, of a botched surgery on this gurney. And then over here, she is a traditional Mexican woman with the back brace and the little sign that says that she's going to sort of remain strong. But again, the landscape is fractured and it shows just, um, just all, all this pain that her body's been through. Um, she is sometimes associated with surrealist artists, and I think particularly with this work that's called Wounded Deer. This is also from 1946. And I think she painted this when she was um, sort of experiencing depression after a surgery that she was particularly hopeful about that didn't go well. So she's showing us here um, as, as an animal, as, as a deer that has been pierced with a number of arrows. She's got the antlers. She still has this um, really sort of easy to identify face with the, with the serious expression and the unibrow, um, but she is sort of alone in the woods. And even the, the even the the trees look like they're dead and dying. There's a, a broken tree branch on the ground in front of her. So there's there's a lot here to su sort of suggest this kind of sense of hopelessness and and all that her body has been through. Um, and then strangely enough, she actually gave this to her friends as a wedding present not long after it was painted. The last painting by by Kahlo that I wanted to show you is this one here, and it's called The Dream of the Bed from 1940. And I think this is a good reminder that in Mexican culture, um, there's a, sort of a different approach to, to, to death in general. Um, there's, you know, the Day of the Dead, where it's like you um, sort of reunite with your with, with your, uh, the spirits of your dead relatives. And apparently Frida Kahlo in her actual life did sleep with, in a bed with a skeleton on top of it. Um, but in this case, 
this skeleton is wired with bombs <laughs> and this skeleton is particularly dangerous. This is like death could go off at any second, even if you're comfortable with it, even if it's close to you. Um, but here's Frida sort of lying peacefully at sleep with, um, with these sort of life-giving vines kind of encircling her. So um, the vines kind of stand in contrast to those wired bombs up above her. So it's this idea that death is kind of ever present and um, and could be just around the corner and 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 of course they're kind of floating in in the sky here in this kind of dreamlike setting. So Frida Kahlo was definitely fierce for how she handled this pain and how she documented it in her work. One of the last artists we're going to be looking at today is an artist that I've always loved named Elizabeth Catlett. And, um, and she was uh, just uh, an incredible uh, printmaker. And so we're going to be looking at examples of her prints and then also one of her sculptures. She said that the purpose to her work was to present Black people in their beauty and dignity for, our, for themselves and for others to understand and to enjoy. And so for that reason, she said she wanted to, um, she wanted her work to be grounded in realism. She wanted it to be something um, that, that everybody could understand and that could tell the story of struggling people. So Elizabeth Catlett was um, an American artist. I, I believe she was also Mexican. Um, so so there's, there's a real interest in kind of showing a cultural identity and, and a history in her work. And this is one of her probably most famous works. And even if you didn't know the title to this, I think we could sort of start off thinking that the woman depicted in this picture is, um, is a strong woman, that she has integrity, that there's, a, a, again, this sort of sense of confidence to her. And I think part of that is because Catlett is showing her um, looking up at her. There's, there's a sense of, of of awe and uh, as you're looking at her. And then you find out that the title of this work is Sharecropper from 1952. And then all of a sudden it sort of shifts how we understand this character that um, Elizabeth Catlett presents. We, we, uh, we, we begin to understand that this is somebody who has worked very, very hard. This is somebody who the system is lined up against and we still see this incredible sense of strength. So just very quickly in terms of how a work like this is created, it would have been, this is a linoleum cut, so it's like a block of linoleum, and, um, and she would have carved out this image, all of these individual lines, and then put ink on the surface of that linoleum block and then pressed a paper into it. So, uh, so the, the amount of detail, the level of de detail here is really just awe-inspiring. So, Elizabeth Catlett would um, tell the story of African American history in a lot of her work. What we're looking at here is a depiction of Harriet Tubman. This is from 1875. Again, another image that I just love so much. Um, she's limited to, to black and white because of the media here. And, um, and so even though it's, you know, this is the Underground Railroad and they're traveling under the cover of darkness, there's all this light around Harriet Tubman. She's this huge figure and she's got this powerful arm that's extending forward. You know, she's leading the way and she's even carrying a rifle here, which you don't see that too often in the history of art. And then of course, all of the people that she's helping um, are sort of lined up behind her. So uh, again, the sense of, uh, of great female leadership here. And Elizabeth Catlett uh, addressed um, violence against African Americans in America <laughs> in the 1940s and in the 1950s. So these are pretty, um, I, I can imagine that, that, these, that it took a, a great deal of bravery to create images like these. So the image on the left is called And a Special Fear for My Loved Ones from 1946. The image on the right is called the Civil Rights Congress from 1950. So both of these images are dealing with um, the subject of violence against black people and, um, and lynchings um, are suggested in both of these with the rope around this man's neck and the, and the noose down here by the young boy's feet, the skeletal figure behind him. So she was not afraid to kind of take on um, the, the very real challenges and hardships of being Black in um, mid-century America. 
And then this last work by Catlett that I wanted to show you is uh, an example of her sculptural work. This is a bronze sculpture of Phyllis Wheatley. It dates to eight, uh, 1973. And Phyllis Wheatley was um, <clears throat> a woman who was uh, a, a, an African woman who was brought to America in the 1700s, and she was the first African-American woman to publish a book of poetry. And um, she was sold into slavery when she was, I think, five or, or seven or eight years old. And she quickly learned um, Greek and Latin. She was writing poetry. She's writing books. I believe she even met uh, George Washington at one point. So um, this image of her uh, was included in her in her in her book of poetry, and that is um, what served as the inspiration for Phyllis Wheatley's sort of timeless depiction. Or I'm sorry, uh, Elizabeth Catlett's timeless depiction of Phyllis Wheatley is just you know a thoughtful um, African American woman. I just love that image. So we're going to finish up our look at these female artists with an artist that many of us have probably heard of before, and that is Maya Lin who's still alive today. She's um, an architectural and landscape designer. And I love this image of her because we see her at a very young age. She was 21 years old and a senior at Yale when she won the blind competition for the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial in Washington, DC. And you really get a sense of just how young she was when, when she won that competition. And I say it's a blind competition because the people who selected her design um, had no idea who she was. And it was, of course, many of you remember a scandal when it came out that she was Chinese American. Um, even our former uh, presidential candidate, Ross Perot, referred to her as an egg roll when it was revealed that she was the winner of this competition. But in 2007, she was ranked 10th on the list of America's favorite architects by um, the American Institute of Architects. So she has gone on to have quite a successful career. But this um, Vietnam Veterans Memorial is really just one of the most striking monuments in all of Washington, DC. I'm sure almost everyone has visited it in person. So it contains over 57,000 names of, of um, soldiers that lost their lives in Vietnam. And it's made up of 246 of these um, black granite balls. And we can see that all of these names are etched in there and that the black granite is, um, is sort of shined to perfection so that it has this mirror-like quality to it. So this is essentially a wedge that is cut into the earth and one, one part of it points to the Washington Monument like we see here, and the other part points to the, the Lincoln Memorial. And so what makes this such an exceptional work of art is because of course everything else in DC is like this white, glowing white marble, and it's so celebratory. I mean, you have the Washington Monument in the background here, and you know, it's all about its height <laughs> and its scale. And here, this is more like a, a scar that's been cut into the earth. And, and I think visiting it for people is in many ways about healing that scar. You literally get to reach out and touch the name of the person that you knew or loved that um, was lost in this war. You can even take a rubbing of their name and bring it, bring a piece of this monument home with you. So um, it's not to say that it was universally loved when it was created, but I think it is really revolutionary in the way that we uh, think about memorializing um, a war that um, that I, I think people were really struggling with how to understand in, in our, our national story. So one other work by um, Maya Lin that I wanted to share with you is down in um, Montgomery, Alabama. This is at the Southern Poverty Law Center. This is the Civil Rights Memorial, dates to 1989. And it's very similar to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in that we have this highly polished stone and it has water flowing down over it. And of course, the quote here from Martin Luther King Jr until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And it has this other sort of circular element that serves as a timeline of the civil rights um, movement 
in the 60s. And so again, you can, you know, lay your hands on it and be like physically connected to these events. Maya Lin received um, the National Medal of the Arts from President Obama in 2009. And, you know, she continues to have a thriving career. So it's really interesting to think about um, you know, what she'll continue to produce and what her leg legacy will be look, will, will look like. But as we wrap up and we look ahead or we consider where we are at least, um, I'm going to bring us back to the Guerrilla Girls, that activist group. Um, and they remind us that you're seeing less than half of the picture without the vision of women artists and women and, and artists of color. So um, another poster that they've created is being angry is a great place to start. And it's interesting for us to think of, of, you know, the kind of cultural shifts, societal shifts, and major events that sort of need to happen in order for us to see real change in the art world and otherwise. But to leave us on sort of a hopeful note here, <laughs> um, even though on the left we have female artists made a little progress in museums since 2008, on the right we have the more positive news that there are museums like Baltimore Museum of Art that make decisions um, like the, the one that we see here that they're only going to collect work by women. So we are beginning to see sort of the, the first shift, <laughs> the, um, the beginnings of, of more awareness in the art world to be more inclusive, to, um, to, to look for more opportunities to have women at the table and in the galleries. So we will end there for now. I, I wanted to thank everybody for staying with me and, um, and going through um, all of these images together. And I welcome any questions or comments you might have. Okay. So we've, we have had a few questions in the, uh, in the chat. Jane, if you wanna stop sharing your screen now, we can um, we'll keep going on the discussion. So, um, there was one question early on about how do you spell the name, or you could say the name again of the, the yes. French miniaturist at the beginning. Yes, it's um, Labille Guillard, and I can get that spelling for you. It's L A B. <laughs> Let me just make sure I'm not butchering this. <laughs> L A B I L L E, and then it's hyphenated G U I A R D. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. We can take more questions in the comments. Oh, uh, I see Ginny link to a book, but I didn't see what the book was. Uh, oh, it was the the Linda Nochlin. Oh, that's great. Oh, I'm glad she did that. <laughs> um, we'll put a link in the a link in the uh, chat yeah. to that to that um, art historian you mentioned. Okay. Um, another question on name. Um, <clears throat> Elizabeth with the sharecropping image. Oh, Elizabeth Catlett, I think. That's yes. It. Can you spell oh, yes. Catlett? It's um, C-A-T-L-E, and I think it's T-T. Let me just double check. Yeah, um, C-A-T-L-E-T-T. -T. Great. Oh, that's a good question. How was it figured out <laughs> that the hands of the, of the of the in the caves were mostly women? That's a really good question. I haven't gone back to the exact um, evidence that they were looking at, but um, but it was published in in um, in National Geographic. So I, I guess they were probably just looking at at the scale of of the hands themselves. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Kay says, I have seen two paintings of Judith beheading Holofernes, one in the Uffizi and one in the Capo de Monte Museum in Naples. Thank you for including her. You almost can't talk about women in art without touching on Artemisia Gentileschi. <laughs> has there ever been a really good movie made about her? I don't know I if they've been good. Be, but <laughs> but there's, there could be some yeah. really terrible ones. Yeah. Oh, I think there have been some terrible ones, yes. <laughs> Yes. Mm. Any other comments in the chat before we before we uh, we let Jane go tonight? Any other questions for Jane? 
Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And if you do have more questions, um, you can find Jane on our website. I linked that uh, in as well um, in the chat. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you very much to Jane. And we will see you next time from Humanities to Go Online. Thanks, so everyone. Thank you. thank you, everyone, and good night.